Good morning. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Wow. This is an amazing facility. I just want to be 12 years old again. It really is beautiful, and the weather was phenomenal. And how do I begin to say thank you for all the people who've put this together, the people at the school, EXP, and a special thanks to Shelly Vincent for getting me here and making it all happen from my perspective. I know I've worked with you, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Jason, all sponsors, Robert, I see Robert's picture up here, right, from Canyon, thank you. Well, let, me, let me begin. There's a ton to talk about. I mean, there's a ton. Oh, here we go. There's a ton to talk about. And my, my attitude here, you're going to hear me conflicted. I'm going to say things are good. I'm going to say things, mm, they're not so good. They're generally good. But there's a potential for problems because interest rates are going up because inflation's high and unemployment's low. And low unemployment's good, but not as low as it is now. This is not a good thing. Let's begin and understand why. So this is, oops, I got a, oops, I'm having some, there we go. This is GDP. GDP is composed of four terms. C, household consumption, first term, 70% of GDP. It's great because we're buying the crap out of the world, right? We can't buy enough stuff. We have nowhere to go. We can't go to a restaurant, so we'll just buy things. We're in a bad mood, we'll buy things. We're in a good mood, we'll buy things. All we want to do is buy, 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 buy. So this, this number is so high, it's making our economy a mess. We can't produce enough stuff because of COVID and supply chain problems. Second term, 15% of GDP. Corporate investments in plant and equipment. Firms aren't investing a lot in plant because no one knows what the plant of the future looks like. There's COVID, distancing, ah, whatever. But they're investing a lot in stuff to overcome COVID. Plexiglass sheets, software, intellectual property, laptop computers, and so on. And they're going to rebuild inventories, right? Because inventories have been crushed because we want so much stuff and we can't rebuild inventories because we can't get stuff because our supply chains don't work. That term's going to be good. The third term's government spending. Not going to be so good because the, all the stimulus money that came in 21, it's going to be gone in 22. The budget deficit in 2020 count, 20 and 21, was $3 trillion bucks each year. This year, $1.2 trillion. So it's still huge but way down. So there's massive fiscal contraction going on in government spending. There's still lots of money, but less. This is exports minus imports, not really important. Mild drag, because our economy grows faster, is growing faster than other countries' economy. And therefore, we're sucking in imports from them. So if it weren't for this money, these imports, inflation would be worse, because supply chain problems would be even more severe. They're still problematic, but they'd be even worse. So you have 85% of GDP right here in CNI doing really well. The rest, ah, eh, it doesn't matter. 85 is rocking. We'll have a good year. This year will show us good growth, right? And you can see the problems that we face oops, here. This encapsulates what's wrong. So COVID starts, and what happens? We all stay home. We don't go anywhere. And spending drops like a friggin' rock. Okay, that's bad enough. But then what happens next? It recovers completely and then goes way high. This is a 20% reduction from baseline to down. This alone is a 20% increase from baseline to up. You've had essentially a 40% boom, boom in, 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 in demand. You fired all your workers here only to find that you need them all like a week and a half later. And then things go into the garbage can and you have COVID at the same time. And so, so, and I'll give you just one example here, and I'm going to beat on China um, because they deserve it. But because they're, <laughs> here's the story. They're the only country left in the world that has a zero pol tolerance policy to COVID. Every other country in the world, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they've all given up on zero tolerance because, because uh, Omega is, uh, Omicron, I'm sorry, hopefully we don't get to Omega. Omicron <laughs> is such an such a infectious variant, right? It's almost hopeless. But every time a, like a town has like 10 COVID patients in, in like a town of 20 million people, they close the town down, the city, the metropolis down. If your supply chain depends on a 10 cent part from there, yeah, it's been nice knowing you. So our supply chain problems aren't going to be gone, but this is why we have so much trouble off the bat. Here's another example to explain why this is. Look at what we're buying. In most recessions, when a recession hits, and you're afraid you're going to lose your job. And I'll give you a choice. You're going to have to spend $20 
and have dinner or spend $40,000 and buy a car, what are you going to do? You're afraid you're going to lose your job. What are you going to do? To have dinner. Yeah, of course. Not this time. Because this time, if you went to dinner two years ago in March, April, you thought you might die. And that was not really appealing. So look what we did. Our spending on both goods and services collapses right off the bat in March, April. And then goods purchases go absolutely bonkers. They peak out in early 21, so a year ago. Our demand for stuff was insatiable. Not services so much because you might die doing something, going to a restaurant or having your nails done or your hair. No, I didn't go to the dentist for a year. They needed like a chisel to clean my teeth and thought I'd have to pull them. I'm joking, but you get the point. Now services are recovering. Goods hopefully come down a bit. That would be nice. We don't need so much. I mean, how many Pelotons do you need? You buy one for yourself and for your mother and for your father, for your brother, your sister. That's enough. We're done. Thank you. That's why their stock is tanking, a whole new conversation. And it's all because of COVID. COVID still runs our economy. There is no doubt about it. I'm going to show you data on open table for restaurant attendance and so on and so forth. The good news is, as you can see, it's peaking. It's come down. We've learned to live with COVID. I mean, look at, our, look at here, how many people are here. We've said to ourselves, we'll take risk. We have to take some risk. We can't live without taking risk. It's not possible. We've all driven here, for God's sake, right? That's the most dangerous thing we do every single day. 40,000 Americans die every year on the roads. And I don't know how many get injured, right? So over 10 years, 400,000. If you live 100 years, that's 4 million car deaths during your lifetime. That's not a trivial number over your lifetime. Your chance of, yeah, I don't want to progress here too far, but COVID's becoming less and less serious. It's still there. We don't know how long the immunity lasts. We don't know what kind of immunity you get from having it. We don't know how good the booster shots are in the long run. Do we get another booster? We don't know. But it's slowly turning from pandemic to endemic phase. There's no doubt about that at all. Absolutely no doubt. Because the number of Americans who've been exposed to either booster shots and boosters boosted and or having gotten COVID is now very high. So we're going to change. And the question is, what does the terminal level look like when we become finally totally endemic? Are we going to lose a million workers a year because of sickness or illness? Two million, a hundred thousand? We don't know that. Endemic is a good thing, but we don't know how good it is yet. We just don't know. But we're starting to see the end game here. I'm con pretty convinced of that. We don't know what it looks like exactly, but we're getting closer, right? So COVID goes, and has, has COVID affected consumer confidence? Yeah, it has. You can see it here. This is Conference Board Consumer Conference, and it's a little bit, you know, it's okay. That's where we were before COVID. That was the worst of COVID. That's where we are now. It's decent, but not spectacular. This question, this survey basically asked the following question. Can you find a job? And the answer is, of course, there are more people unemployed. There are more open jobs than there are unemployed Americans. It's easy to find a job. Anybody with a pulse that can show up to work can get a job. If I could be 16 years old again, I would work two jobs. McDonald's getting paid 18 bucks an hour and doing something else on weekends making 18 bucks an hour. I could be making 60,000 bucks, 70,000 bucks a year as a 16, 17-year-old kid. These are dead-end jobs, I understand, but there's a lot of potential here. The, the desperation's profound, right? But here's another question now. This is next one. University of Michigan index. This one looks like garbage. It's terrible. Why? The Michigan survey asks different questions. It's not just for Michigan people. It's University of Michigan. It's a long-dated survey. It's been out for decades. They ask you, hey, uh, you want to buy a house? How about a car? And uh, how's inflation doing? Now, no one in their right mind would choose to voluntarily buy a car now because there are no cars to buy. And I know there are a lot of realtors in the audience, and you're going to hate me for saying this, but again, no one in their right mind would choose to buy a house right now because in all of Colorado, there are like four houses. I looked, four. On the MLS, I looked, four. Car said four houses, each one, four million bucks, only in Breckenridge. Yeah. Summit County, Eagle County, you get the idea. So this survey is asking particularly rough questions given our economy. The other questions on the other survey were better. So we're somewhere in the middle. We're somewhere between unhappy and happy enough. That having been said, we're still buying our brains out. Maybe we're doing it because we're miserable. It's a lot of retail therapy. I don't know, but we're, the economy's pretty decent. Not great, but decent. Well, I gotta go this way. This is restaurant traffic. So this is really getting at COVID. 
Because you've got to feel confident enough to go out and risk getting sick. Or some governments in some states have precluded or had the mask mandates or whatever it is, right? And the key point is here. Black is the U.S. as a whole. This is the line that's black. Right before COVID, right before the, Delta, the, the Omicron variant, right there, we were back at baseline at zero. Things were good. And then Omicron comes and poof, way down. This isn't government telling us what to do. In a few cases, it's by and large people saying, you know, I have a choice. I can go get a Big Mac and get sick or stay home. Eh, I'm going to stay home. If you were an economist, you'd say your discount rate had to be very high for you to trade off getting ill for a hamburger. That seems like a stupid choice. People aren't making it essentially, right? This is retarding our growth. GDP in Q1 right now is not going to be that good because January and February of this year are going to be manhandled by Omicron, right? And we're going to get beyond that come March when it's, it's already in the rearview mirror. But in the short term, December of last year and Jan, Feb of this year are going to be hurt just as Q3 was last year. Q3 was really hurt because Delta, because the Delta variant came. It came on July 1st or July 2nd and wrecked three months of GDP. We may have this in the future. Each time, it's subsequently less economically impactful because we manage this better and better. We learn to live with the consequences. We learn to live with how to deal with it. We learn how much safety and how much precaution we have to take, but it hits us. Overall, consumption's pretty good. This was, this was, this was trend. Look at that. We're above trend right now. Yeah, there was this little accident there. We won't talk about that. How can we recover so fast? We recover so fast because of phenomenal monetary policy, wildly expansionary monetary policy. Interest rates, the Fed re reduces them to zero. Now inflation's at 7%, 6%. 10-year treasury is paying what? 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6. Inflation's 6. So 6 minus 1.4? It's negative, wildly negative. Interest rates have almost never been cheaper than they are now. So we have massively stimulative monetary policy, and we had incredibly stimulative fiscal policy. Congress was sending out checks to everybody. My daughter, she got like three stimmy checks, and she calls me up, Papa, how come there's all this money in my bank account? I, I, I didn't know what to tell her. Half of me said, don't get me started, and the other half said, don't, I don't know where to begin. But it was, it was crazy, right? There was wash PPP loans, unemployment money, minus state and local governments. The fiscal stimulus was profound. And because of that, because of the massive fiscal stimulus and massive monetary stimulus, we now have highbrow problems in the US economy. We're growing fast, and we, we've created inflation. Inflation is not great, but the alternative to inflation is unemployment, which is worse. I would take the inflation. If I had to choose one, I don't want either. If I had to choose one, I'd take inflation because at least people are working and making a salary. If there's an unemployment, people are unemployed. They're not working. That's even worse, right? This is a problem. We're growing too fast right now. So the Fed's going to raise rates and slow it down. This is okay. Again, this is pretty good news, right? Mm -hmm. I get closer. Closer? I don't know. I don't have the skills. Ah. How about, man, this, oops, went too far. There you go. This is manufacturing. They're pretty happy. They're shockingly happy. How can you be so happy? This is 2005, 16 years of data. How can you be this happy? You can't get workers. You can't get inputs. You can't get parts. And if you get all that stuff, you can't get transportation services to deliver the thing to wherever it has to go. They can make cars, car makers, right? They, they can't make enough cars. Whatever you make, you can't make enough of them. You can't get the parts. It's, but they're very happy, right? They're very happy. It's shocking, really. This is now the next slide is services. OK, they've been whacked a little bit because of COVID, right? Right there. But they're still pretty happy. They've learned to live with COVID. COVID's not so bad. It isn't great. But it's not so bad. Yeah, the restaurant took a hit. The hotel took a hit. The ski slope took a hit. Whatever it is or was. But they're going to get over it. And they know they're going to get over it. It's not going to be so bad. So consumer sentiment's decent. Manufacturers, retailers, wholesalers, decent. This is next one, small business, decent. Again, not spectacular the last three, four, five months, but not awful. This is, again, 10 years of data. It's pretty decent, right? Okay. 
No one's miserable here. We're not thrilled out of our minds. We're fearful about inflation. All a bunch of surveys talk about that, but we're generally happy enough, especially given the trauma that we've been through. This is the problem our economy faces. There's no friggin' inventory. Look at that. Bottom right-hand corner, retailer inventory. It's a sales ratio. So it was bouncing around here. This is no one buying anything. So the sales were full on March 15th when COVID starts. Everyone goes home. Sales plummet. So the ratio skyrockets. And then everybody goes to the store and starts hoarding toilet paper. I don't understand. How can you... What, you're going you're gonna to poop more? <laughs> how much food and... What do you, how do you store? Why? I don't understand. And then it falls. And it gets a little better. And then it falls more. And for the last six, eight months, it's been around 1.1. This is crazy low. I go to CVS. They don't have what I want. I want to buy shoes. I want to buy blue shoes. No, how about buying yellow ones instead? No, I want sneakers. How about buying patent leather ones? No, they want to upsell me or resell me or different sell me or something, right? I get angry. There's nothing you can do about it. But this is causing inflation because you can't get what you want. No one can get what they want. You want a car? There aren't any cars to buy. So you buy a used car. And the used car prices have gone up almost 100% in the last 12 months because there's no cars. We're underselling by 5 million cars a year, and that's wrecking the entire car market. The car market, usually 17 million cars, new cars, and about 40 million used cars. That's 60 million cars. You're short 5 million cars, it's almost 10%. And 10% is enough to entirely wreck the entire market of cars. Completely wreck it. And it's happening all over the place, right? Houses? There are no houses to buy, right? None. And then you have these guys from California coming here because they can work from home. It drives the price even higher. Less supply, more demand, like, like the car market. This is lack of inventory is pervasive, and the builders can't build more. We'll talk about that a little bit later, right? But this is a huge problem. And the question is, how long does this persist? Is this going to go away tomorrow, next week, next month, next year? So here's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is, there's a real problem. These ships aren't being unloaded. There are 100 ships off the port of LA Long Beach. So all our imports from China, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and so on, Philippines, whatever, come from there. And there aren't nothing. There's not, there's, they, they don't have the trucks to unload. They don't have tractors to pull them. They don't have flatbed trucks. They don't have drivers. If you want to put on a train, there are no conductors for the trains, and there are no trains. And the stuff sits on port and can't get unloaded. So the ships can't get anywhere. It's been a while already. We've had this now for months. You can see it here. It starts in November. It's been three months of no relief. I, went, I actually spoke to some people at the Port of LA Long Beach. A couple people there told me, both independently said, give us six to eight months, this problem will be gone. Maybe they're right. Who knows? I don't know. I don't think they lied to me, but who knows, right? So my thinking is we are now at the worst of this supply chain problem. And then the inflation that's generated because of the shortage of goods and services that are out there will slowly dissipate. The question is how fast? That's the big. When's it start and how fast does it go down? Those are the questions that the Fed's dealing with right now and really having heartache over. Now, if you ask people how fast this problem goes away, the answers aren't great. This question was asked first on November 4th, and that's the lighter color. It was asked again on Jan 14th in the darker color. So on November 4th, the answers were here, second quarter of 22, so in a few months, three, four months, and the second half of 22, so July through December. That's where the number, the, the most of the respondents were saying the supply chain problems would end. Then they go forward a few months, two months and a week, right? Two months and 10 days, whatever. They ask again, and what happens? They migrate to second half of 22, and now a big chunk, 30%, think it's going to be 23. So this problem could persist for an easily another year. The guy head, head of Ford said another year for the supply chain problems they're facing. So this inflation problem should begin to go away, and it probably peaks this quarter, but it ain't going to be gone in a hurry because these problems are going to persist. It's really a nasty problem. This supply chain problem is a problem. 
there's a silver lining if you're in business. Look at corporate profits. They're astoundingly high. Well, we're buying our brains out. Okay, I got that. Aren't the cost of inputs higher? Isn't labor higher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How come corporate profits are so good? Corporate profits are so good because one, interest rates are super low. So if you're a firm that borrows lots of money to do your stuff, psh, cost of interest rates have gone way down. Cost of money is way cheap. The second thing is there's, there, there, there are other, other things going on here too, right? Uh, you've gotten more efficient in your supply chain. You're more, more efficient in your production facility. GDP is 2% higher than it was before COVID began. Number of people on payroll has declined. We're doing more with less. Yeah, wages are up, but inflation's eating the real wages away so that real wages are declining. So you're getting more output, less money. And the third reason, firms have pricing power. For 10 years, for 20 years, firms had no pricing power. For 20 years, firms had no pricing power because Walmart showed up. And Walmart's management of inventory was spectacularly good. They swiped, you know, every purchase they swiped, and they knew what to do with that. And they redesigned entire retail. They were masters of retail. And what happened after that? Then comes the internet for real and Amazon. And Amazon teaches Walmart a lesson on inventory. So for 20 years in a row, we've had huge firms driving down the cost of, of, of manufactured goods, importing it from foreign countries at cheap rates. Right? Now firms finally have pricing power. What are they doing? They're using it. They're jacking up their prices. They're making tons of money. Who would have thought this in the midst of a recession, a two-month recession that's terrible? The world is completely different than it was. Car manufacturers are making fewer cars. Lots are empty. Prices are up. Profits are up. This is crazy. No one could have foreseen this. So what do firms do with their money? They buy back their shares. This is through end of October. Over a trillion dollars of equity has been removed. So the remaining equity gets more expensive. That's part of the reason the stock market's gone up so well. There are other reasons. Earnings have been good and so on. But this certainly contributes to the story. So you've got corporate profits that are good. They're buying back their shares. What happens to the stock market? Okay, lately there's been a little bit of heartburn. I understand. I feel your pain. Trust me. But all in all, that's been a good run, right? The stock market's doing pretty well here. It really is. There's no question about it. Stock market's doing well. The bond market until recently is doing well. Home prices, they're fine, thank you very much. You own some multifam property, it's doing great too. You own some cell phone stock, your cell phone tower stock. How about logistics companies? How about cold storage or storage? How about logistics? How about you know, industrial stuff, manufacturing facilities? They're rocking it. This is almost an everything rally, right? So household savings has gone up too. That's weird. In most recessions, it doesn't happen. This, these are recession bars here, 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 here. We go back a lot of recessions. This is 1975. But you look at most recessions, you know, oh, it goes up a little after it, it, was, it was low. It goes up a little and it stays a little higher because people didn't save enough money there. Here, there's no real change. Look at these numbers. We had nothing to do. We had nowhere to go. How many of you in summer of 2020 had vacation plans to go somewhere? Yeah, you were going to go somewhere. And suddenly you had nowhere to go. You had saved up for a year or two years. You were going to go with your family to, I don't know where, you know, uh, Australia or Europe or South America. Nowhere to go. So instead, we'll save the money. Maybe we'll spend it. We'll see. But savings rates go crazy. You kept your job, right? You had savings. You got stimmy checks. Interest rates fell through the floor. Let's buy a house. You couldn't afford one, but now you can afford to buy two. I mean, maybe not, but you get the point. And these were aided and abetted by stimmy checks. Stimmy check one, President Trump. Stimmy check two, President Trump. I think $1,500, that was $600. That was President Biden's stimmy check, $1,400. So it drove them way up. Banks are awash in cash. This is unbelievable. So look at household balance sheets. They're unbelievable. This is partly why housing has done so well. Because people who heretofore had a job and had good income and had no savings suddenly saved a bucket of money. Because they had nowhere to go. They couldn't go on their trip. And they got 20 or 30,000 bucks floating. I have friends of mine, relatives, who call me up. I don't know why they tell me this. It's depressing. 
But they call me, I'm an economist. They know I like weird stories. They tell me, they say, they say, Ellie, you know, we, we, I have, we, my wife and I, her husband, we go out and we see friends, we go places and do things, but now it's COVID, we don't go anywhere, and we're saving a thousand bucks a month, or two thousand a month, whatever. And then the kicker, you know what? And we realized our friends and family aren't worth it. I felt personally insulted, but nah, that's another story. I'm not going to go there. But suddenly, two thousand a month for a year and a half, you got, you got twenty, thirty thousand bucks, and I can get a down payment on a house. Income. You have good income, now you have wealth, now you're buying stuff. You're bu you want to buy a car, psh, price up. You want to buy a house, psh, price up. And then inventories go to hell and supply chains are a wreck. Unbelievable, unbelievable, right? So look at bankruptcy. You'd think under normal conditions, under recession, people lose their jobs and there's tons of bankruptcy. We lose, I'll show you later, 22 and a half million jobs. 22 and a half million jobs, 11 years of job growth. What happens to bankruptcy? It declines. 21 days almost out through, through November. I looked at it, and it's very low again. Why? Why is it so low? Did you have to pay your mortgage? No. Because you went to forbearance program. Pay your rent? Ah, don't bother. There's an eviction moratorium. You have a student loan? Let it go. I have a niece. She's three. Her, favorites, her favorite movie is Frozen. I can't stand the movie. I hate it. I flat out hate it. Let it go. Let it go. That's it. Let it go. Don't pay your mortgage, don't pay your rent, don't pay your student loans, and it's fine. Suddenly, life is pretty pleasant and no one's defaulting. And then eventually, over time, the jobs come back and people are fine again. Thank you. This is an example of kicking the problem, the can, down the road far enough such that the problem disappears. Sometimes you can do that in life. You just kick the can and it's fine. Not often, but it happens. So look, this is okay too. So you have households that are spending and feeling in good shape, bankruptcies are low, firms are feeling pretty happy, supply chains are a wreck, but we're buying things, manufacturers are reasonably happy, supply service providers are reasonably happy, small businesses reasonably happy. This is okay, this is not the normal recovery from a recession, we're much happier than we should be at this juncture, just two and a half years out of the worst of the thing, right? And we have had multiple uh, uh, subsequent uh, variants that have come along the way. This one's a little less pleasant. This is government spending. This was the housing bust. Obama passes the trillion dollar ARRA. Deficits get large. Congress then put slams on the fiscal brakes, raises taxes, cuts spending, whatever. And we, 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 we get the fiscal house back in order to some extent. Then we see the same thing all over again here. House, the economy crashes. The House and Senate pass a huge, huge spending bill, the CARES Act, right? Trillions of dollars come floating out through Washington, D.C. in all kinds of myriad ways. Deficits are huge. They're three trillion bucks a year in 20, as I mentioned earlier, three trillion dollars in 21, and now they're much lower. They're 1.2 trillion bucks. That's a reduction of 1.8 trillion bucks. That reduces GDP. It hurts, it hurts the economy. It's the right thing to do. You can't run these deficits that are immensely large, but in the short run, it takes a little bit of a toll. So fiscal policy is no longer going to be expansionary, it's contractionary. Monetary policy now is on the verge of starting to tighten. It will not be tight by any stretch of the imagination, but it will be tighter than it was. That, it's going to be tighter and tighter and tighter for years, for two or three years. They'll keep raising rates, right? So we're beginning tighter monetary policy, and fiscal policy already is reasonably tight. So this is, this is we're cha things are changing, right? Fiscal policy, monetary policy, it's starting to change a little bit. Now you ask me, people say to me, but Elliot, Biden just passed the infrastructure bill. He didn't pass the Build Back Better bill, that's on this side, but he passed the infrastructure bill on this side. 1.2 trillion bucks over 10 years. Isn't that going to be inflationary? That's a lot of money, right? Hold off here, why? President Trump passed the first CARES Act piece in, in, in March, April of 2020, two trillion bucks. He passed another one in December of 2020, six or 700 billion bucks. Then President Biden passed one in March of 21, two more trillion bucks, and that's almost $5 trillion. That's wildly stimulative, and that's partly why we have inflation, not entirely, but partly. That money was purely deficit financed. There were no tax increases, all the money came at us within 12 months. So in 12 months, there was $5 trillion of money coming to us. Even though our economy is 22 trillion bucks, that's a lot of money. This is different. 
It's 1.2 trillion over a decade. So it's a quarter as much money over a period 10 times as long. And there's some taxes that are going up. They took money from other buckets that would have been spent elsewhere to cover this. So the economic stimulus of this is much lower. And this is the kicker. Two things kicker. One, we were on a baseline of already spending 600 billion bucks over the next decade. This is an extra 600 billion on top. A non-trivial amount of money. It's more than I make in a year, 600 billion. Even two years. If I were a realtor, maybe differently, but okay. Um, <laughs> 600, billion, 600 billion bucks. But how big is the US economy over the next 10 years? About $250 trillion. 60 billion, it's a lot of zeros. It's nine zeros, 60 and nine zeros. Over 250 and 12 zeros. Do the math, knock off those zeros. It's not a big percentage. In the short run, could it cause inflation because there aren't enough workers and not enough supplies? Yeah, 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 I'm with you. But can it systematically cause inflation down the road in a serious way? I, I, I simply don't see it. It's not ameliorated in the short run, it's not. In the long run, hopefully the money gets spent and we get something useful for it too. We're not taking the money and literally throwing it down the toilet either, right? Now hopefully we end up with something valuable for the extra 600 billion that we're spending and the 1.2 trillion in total. I don't know, but you get my point. So there may be some ameliorating benefits. There's some tax increases going on to help. This is not going to be a huge thing. Maybe it boosts GDP by a 20th of a point. So 0 0.05. That's what this may get us. Not a lot. It will be helpful, but it, it's not going to change wildly. It's like rearranging chairs on the Titanic. It may feel good, but it's not a lot of, there's something good here, but not wildly, right? This is the build back better. It may happen, it may not. We'll see what happens when it happens. I mean, it's, it's too far to think about it right now. You put it all together, what's GDP looking like? So here, you see it. US 5.7 and 21, 4% and 22, 2.4% and 23. These are estimates from about a month ago. Maybe it's a bit lower now. Don't, don't, don't look at this as this. That's completely wrong. It's true, but wrong. This is much higher, lower, still lower. Mm. The thing is, that's more normal GDP growth. This is the exception this year, and that was the exception last year, because we were on the stimmy high from all the fiscal and monetary stimulus coursing through our economy as it gets pulled away and we revert to normal growth. This past year, we created like 7 million jobs, the most jobs in the history of the US. We can't keep doing it. There aren't workers returning to work. This year will still create three and a half to four million jobs, well above trend. That's why GDP is so good. But once they're all back at work, there's nothing left to employ. That's why GDP returns to normal, low twos. Maybe the build back better gets us a little extra GDP growth, right? Maybe firms investing in equipment get us a little more growth, but nothing really spectacular here. We're going to get back to normal. That's the way it is. It's not good or bad. Now, labor markets are the biggest problem that we've got. I think everybody here who's in business looks and says, holy cow, I need to hire workers, but there's no one to friggin' hire. Right? Raise your hands if you've seen this problem or heard about it. Yeah, right. If you're in manufacturing, it's especially a serious problem or a service problem, like a restaurant or a hotel or something. So what's the problem? Let me first explain to you that this problem is not quite as bad. It's bad, but not nearly as bad as you think. This is a dot-com bust here, eight, nine months. This is the housing bust, 18 months. This is COVID, two-month recession. In the dot-com bust, we lost 3 million jobs, peak to trough, 3 million. It took us four years to recover the jobs. Four, from here to there, four years. You with me? We lost 3 million jobs from here to there. It took us four years to get them back. You with me? Now, dot, now the housing bust, 8 million jobs, peak to trough, 8 million jobs. It took us six years to get them back, or roughly six years, right? From 2008 to 2014, ballpark, maybe 2015, so it took seven years. You get the idea. Now, the Fed says to itself, hmm, we lose how many jobs this, this recession? 22 and a half million jobs. Not three million, not eight million. 22 and a half million. And the Fed, the Fed says to itself, those jobs aren't going to come back in an hour and a half. There's no way. 
it's going to take years to get those jobs back, right? Years, years and years. So the Fed a while back said, yeah, we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future because unemployment's really, really high. Sit back, relax, enjoy the low rates. We're not going to raise rates until unemployment gets back to where it kind of belongs. And a year ago, inflation was 1.1% year over year. No inflation, high unemployment, no prospects for inflation hitting, and unemployment not really going up, coming down nicely, but not that fast. And then unemployment starts to fall like a rock. We've replaced most of the jobs. So here's unemployment. Watch. This is the dot-com bust. How long does it take unemployment rate to come back to where it was before it started? I don't know, 1990 to 1996, six years? This is the housing bust. How long did it take unemployment to come back to where it was before it started? 2008 to 2017. Nine years. The Fed figured it had tons of time on its hands. Unemployment wasn't going to come down anytime soon. And then what the hell happened? Unemployment comes down like a Bugs Bunny cartoon and Wile E. Coyote pushes the anvil off a cliff to kill the Roadrunner, but the Roadrunner, of course, escapes naturally. That's the premise of the whole cartoon. Unemployment is falling much too fast. Much too fast. You've got 7% inflation, which is very high, and you have very low unemployment, which is much too low too quickly. The Fed never dreamt in its worst nightmares it would have this problem. Okay, unemployment's a little high. We can let it rip. We can keep rates low because we have high unemployment. Unemployment's not bad, but low inflation. Well, we can keep rates low because we want to get inflation up because it's too low at 1%. But now they have no quarter. Everywhere they look, they got a problem. The Fed's job is full employment. Congratulations, you've got full employment. Fed's job is stable prices. 7% is not stable prices. Two or three is stable prices. So prices are going up too fast. Unemployment's falling too quickly. And they've got to start slowing down the economy. Otherwise, inflation will get worse. Now, if we can go in now, why is unemployment falling so fast? It's a little weird. We still haven't got back three and a half million jobs that we lost. Employment is still three and a half million lower than it was. How can unemployment be at 3.9? It's too damn low. That's why. People dropped out of the labor force. People who are, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is. Here's, I'll give you a whole bunch, but here's. People are unemployed right now. If you're unemployed, you look for a job generally, right? That's what you do. Not now. Why? There are so many jobs out there. People can say, you know, I don't want to look for a job. I want to go on a longer vacay. And when I run out of money, I'll look for a job. And I'll find a job in 30 minutes because there's many more job openings than there are people. Since it's easy to find a job, I'm not going to look for a job. You with me here? Mm, It's crazy. If there were fewer jobs, they'd be looking for jobs. And then people retired because their portfolios did so well. Their house is way up in value. Their bonds are up in value. Their rental property is doing really well. Their car is worth more money than they paid for it two years ago. They can go, huh, I'm going to retire. And they quit. Suddenly you're out of workers. Here's the story. So I'm going to give you like seven reasons why people are no longer working. Oh. No, I missed a whole bunch of slides there. I'll come back to that. I got to show you all the other intervening slides. Ah, retirees are up. I mentioned that before, right? People quit for two reasons. They're rich and they can afford to quit. They didn't know they were rich, but they got rich because their portfolio did well. And the second reason they quit is fear of COVID. Let me give you an example of this. Think with me here. What's the worst possible job to have during an epidemic like COVID? I think it's being a a manicurist. Oh, nurse, 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 nurse. Manicurist is next, right? (laughs) Why is a manicurist so bad? Here's my hand, please. And and put a little flower on the thumb if you don't mind. (sighs) 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 All day long, people come for a half hour, (sighs) and they breathe all over you, and they kill you. (laughs) And you're 63. 
And you go, you know, I'm not going to die painting people's nails. I'm out of here. So you quit. And at 63, you don't come back to work. Uh, you're done. The, people, the labor force is declining most among people over 55. It's going up among 16 to 19-year-olds because pay is so good. But among people who are older, nearing retirement, they retire, they get social, they're done. They live off their wealth or they sponge off their family. I know what that's like. Um, and so on. Next, daycare problems. Schools aren't open. Aspen Academy, congratulations to you for staying open during the whole entire COVID. Kudos to you. An immensely big deal. An immensely big deal. Now schools, I read they have, they have mental health days. The school hasn't been open like in two years. The kids come back for a month or so, and now they have, we need a Friday off for mental health. No, as a parent, let me tell you, a mental health day is when my kid goes to effing school. <laughs> That's my mental health. And the kid needs to go to school too because no one learns anything when they're at home. That's just bad. I mean, certain parents homeschool their kids. Great. But that's not what the not, uh, 99 of the population wants. It's what 2 or 3 or 4% want. It's a big difference. So kids can't go to school or kids can't get to daycare if they're under school age. Someone's got to stay home. That's really bad. I think there's a slide before that. Then there's people died. By the end of summer, by the middle of summer, we'll have a million dead Americans because of COVID. I can perfectly forecast they will never come back to the labor force. You lost three or 400,000 workers there, right? This is people who are employed, working for a firm, but home because they're sick. This is, I got this from the BLS Le Wait, what, Bureau of Labor's website a couple days ago. So it's hanging out at about a million for years and years. This is, this is a 2011, flatter than a pancake, right? And then it goes to a million and a half. Now, it's averaging about a million and a half. 500,000 workers are staying home because they're sick extra. That's COVID. People caring for someone with COVID, long COVID, right? Your mother, your brother, your uncle, your aunt, whatever it is, right? Sister, whatever. Stay at home, COVID. And then there's immigration. Had we kept the policies that were in place when Obama was president, we'd have now roughly 2 million more immigrants. We can argue whether we want them or not. That's an entirely separate conversation. I'm not here to, to bash or promote Trump or Obama or anybody or Biden. That's not the issue here. The issue is there are a bunch of reasons why we don't have enough workers. There's like six or seven or eight or nine. I'm giving you some, right? But it's a myriad complex situation, and it's something that no one foresaw. Nobody foresaw the magnitude of this problem of people dropping out, not wanting to work. People have faced death. They've seen death. They've stayed home with their families. And oddly enough, they like it, and they don't want to go back to work. If I stayed home with my ex-wife, I would have killed her. She would have killed me. That's why we got divorced, but I digress. People spend time with their grandkids. They liked it, and they don't want to give it up. My Uber driver used to work. She had a job today in the airport. She had a job doing whatever it is. She now does Uber full time. She controls her agenda. She works as much as she wants, and she's making twice as much money. It's not a bad outcome for her. And she, this is after car depreciation and gasoline. We had a long conversation. I really think very highly of this woman. It's a really interesting story, right? And on top of that, people open their own business. It's the American dream. You're learning about it in school here, aren't you? You're making, you're making truffles and you're making toffee, right? I saw two people out there selling stuff, right? Shamelessly self-promotion and so on. Good for you. It's the American way. Um, people say, look, no mortgage, no rent, no student loan payment, stimmy checks, and a ton of unemployment insurance. Has there ever been a better time to go on your own? No, let's go. And what do you see? This is all applications for, for people opening up their own business. This is the bump in number of firms that open up that have employees, a much more serious thing. So for all these reasons, our labor markets are totally screwed up. It's really wild. I'll give you a, another simple example of this. Polis, you're a Democratic governor, right? So Colorado didn't do it, but there are red states, Republican governors. Last summer, so six, eight months ago now, the labor problem was severe. And the Republican states, the governors, by almost all of them said, we're going to cut, stop the, the generous unemployment benefits early. So that we'll force people to go back to work because they won't get the subsidy from the government to not work. And the thinking was, if they don't have money, they'll go back to work. Logical, right? And completely wrong. Because you see here, there are a thousand reasons and the workers haven't returned. 
If they hear six, seven months later, they haven't returned. The, 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 the civilian labor force participation went down, came back up, and has barely moved since. They just don't want to work. And they're changing their careers, and they're rethinking things, and they're taking a vacation. There's a whole lot of stuff going on, right? It's pretty amazing. But this is hurting labor markets in the short run. But people are much happier. They're, these two people are leaving. They're not happy, obviously. They're unhappy. This is the Colorado welcome I expected to walk out in the middle of my presentation. I'm barely halfway through. It's really rude, you know. Have a heart for me. Why couldn't you sat in the back row? You're disturbing people while you leave. Really? Really? Wow. Rugged. Rugged. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Yeah. They're retired. <laughs> now, let's see who's getting, whose unemployment rates are changing the most. This is interesting. College, some college, high school, no high school. The non-high school people had a very high unemployment rate for a very long time. These guys all returned to work. And now this number is plummeting. To get them back, they have to pay them a lot more money because they don't want to do what they did. People have less hospitality, leisure hospitality, restaurants, drinking places, and droves. People don't, don't find satisfaction in those jobs. Those are low-paying, hard jobs. You're on your feet all day long. People treat you like a farm animal and pay you like crap. After COVID, people go, you know, I don't think my future involves cleaning soiled bedpans. I think I can do something else. So to lure them back is hard. Marriott fired them all two years ago. Now they want you back. And you know what their response is to the CEO of Marriott? <laughs> I don't think so. You're going to have to pay me a boatload more money to come back. Oops. I think I went through two slides there. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. So look at wage growth. Wage growth is up. There's no question wage growth is up. It's now going at 4.5%. Now inflation's like 6, right? So real wages still aren't rising. Interesting. So workers are kind of fussy. They're getting pay raises that are good, the best in a long time. But inflation's eating up their money. Let's break this down a little more. Wait, markets are good. There's a lot of unemployed, very few unemployed people, a lot of jobs to fulfill. Wages are going up. What are workers doing? Workers are feeling really good about themselves right now. Look at this. This is friggin' crazy. This is quit rates. How what percentage of the labor force is quitting their job every month? Right now, it's as high as it's ever been since this data was collected. Four and a half million Americans every month quit their job, equal to 3% of the labor force. 36% of people quit their job over the course of a year. A third of the labor force. We've never seen anything like this in history. Now, go back in history. When it's bad, what is it? The bottom, this is the dot-com bust. And things get worse after the recession ends. It bottoms out at 1.5. This, this is the housing bust. Bottoms off at one, really terrible. COVID bottoms out at 1.4. 1.4, 1.5, one, call it 1.5, right? That's really bad. You with me? Now, let's go forward, and when's it really good? 2.4, 2.2, 2.4. So it ranges roughly between 1.4 and 2.4. 1.4 sucks, 2.4 is unbelievable. And what's it now? Three. It's 20% higher than it's ever been. Workers are quitting their jobs in droves and getting better jobs and making more money. And here's the proof. Right there. If you're a winner and you quit your job and you have cojones, you're making 5.5% pay. But if you're a loser and you stay in your old job, you're getting four. It pays to leave. So I find this out, I switch my jobs, and I get 14 job interviews first, and they pay me $1,000 for each interview. I take the interview money and never call them back. <laughs> get the 14 out, and then get another job. And I tell my brother, my brother tells his friend, and, and so on and so forth, and we all are changing jobs. That's what's happening. Now, who's getting the money? Oops, I missed a slide. There we go. Low-wage workers. 
low-wage workers, since 2015, 16, somewhere in the middle there, late 15, the blue line begins to exceed the yellow and the green, middle and high-income workers' wages. And then COVID pushes it into overdrive. Well, you think, you're thinking, it's just low-wage workers. Who cares? There aren't that many of them. They get five bucks an hour. It's not going to overwhelm inflation, the whole economy. And you're right. This may cause three quarters of 1% of overall increase in inflation from six to seven, six and a quarter to seven. It's not a lot. But now I'm thinking, look, they're getting a pay raise. And inflation's there. And I want to get more money too. So if we all start asking for more money and we get more money, the firms that pay us more have to charge more for the stuff that we're making and selling. And as those get more, the inflation was up and I asked for more money. And the stuff they had to charge more money for the services that we provide. And then I want more money. Demand pull, cost push, inflation. You have a wage price spiral. And the Fed goes, oh my God. We're in deep doo-doo here. Because once you think there's going to be inflation, you behave accordingly. You want to pay raise. You know, you'll pay, you're going to pay more money for stuff because things cost more because of inflation. And that leads to more and more inflation. That happened in the 60s and the 70s. Fed's terrified of that. And Powell doesn't want to go down in history as a central banker who destroyed, who wrecked 40 years of low inflation by being, by being bad. So he's not going to let it happen, right? But inflation's here, there's no doubt. So labor markets are tight. People are quitting their jobs. They're getting decent pay increases because there's not enough workers to go around because many have quit, and the ones who haven't quit are changing their jobs all the time. Inflation is not really a problem as far as I see it. There's no real problem here, right? Prices have, what they call it, skimpflation, right? I go to a hotel. I go to a lot of hotels. They don't clean your room anymore. They charge the same price. They don't clean your room. That's a reduction in service. Hotel quality has gone down. Cost of hotel services have gone up. I'm not getting my value anymore. Half the fun of the hotel was clean sheets, everything that I didn't have to change and launder. Look at inflation. It's huge. It's huge. This is core inflation in red. No food and energy. Red, blue is food and energy. Ignore the blue. Just look at the red. Because food and energy prices go up and down. Eggs, milk, oil, gas, propane, natural gas, all these things. Cereals, they go up and down. The red tries to ignore that. The real inflation. It's really up there. But it's going to start to go down. The demand for stuff will soon be sated. The savings that was generated because of COVID for savings will go away. The supply chains will eventually get fixed. The question again is how quickly that's the issue. If it's not fast enough and the inflation hangs around for another year and our, in minds we have 7% inflation, we're going to go to our boss and say, give me 10%. I need 7 for inflation and 3 because I'm better at my job this year than I was last year. And if we all start getting 10% pay raises, inflation is going to start to go up at 7 to 8%. That's a real problem. The Fed doesn't want that in the worst way because to get rid of that inflation is very hard. We have to change our expectations from 10% down to 2%. For those of you old enough in the room, I don't know if there's anybody old enough in the room to remember who's like over 60, 55. Paul Volcker was a central banker in 79, appointed by President Carter. He created two recessions in our economy in the early 80s, the double dip recession of the early 80s. Why? To get our minds around the idea that he wasn't going to tolerate inflation. He created one short-term recession. People didn't believe he was serious, and inflation came back. So he said, you know what? I'm going to drive rates up to 15 and 20% to kill inflation, to convince you as consumers and investors and borrowers and lenders that there isn't going to be any inflation, but it took two recessions to do it. Once the expectations are out of, the, out of the, the Pandora's box, it's a real problem here, right? So inflation, I thinking is inflation is not going to be that bad and it will go away. The question is when? So this is why I've, I'm kind of optimistic. Inflation is being driven primarily by this and purple. This is goods, and goods mean supply chains. And they'll get fixed eventually, a year, a year and a half. This goes away. This is energy. Energy is expensive. Oil is 80 bucks a barrel. Last year was 40 bucks a barrel. I get it. But next year it's not going to be 120 and then 160. That's not going to happen. So energy goes up and it stops. It may even come down again with excess supply. The U.S. produces more oil or Saudi Arabia or Russia or whoever it is, right? So this goes away in time and that goes away. 
All you're left with is this and this little sliver in between. But the question is when, even if I'm right and my timing is wrong, I'm effectively wrong. And a lot of people like me who thought this would go away have been proven wrong so far. I hate to admit it, I was wrong. I think I'm still right, but it may not matter if it doesn't fall fast enough. And if the labor market doesn't improve quick enough and supply chain problems don't go away fast enough and if excess demand isn't stopped quick enough, it could persist a while longer. The Fed can't take any more chances anymore. It has no choice. It must raise rates. The other thing making me think I'm right is real disposable income. So after you pay your taxes, incomes have been going down for the last six months because inflation's eating away at wages. And monetary policy is getting tighter. And fiscal policy is getting tighter on top of the four things I just said. There are six friggin' reasons why I'm right. But I'm still wrong. So I, I, I'm convinced the theory's on my side. But unfortunately, no one cares. In practice, I'm still wrong. So the Fed's got to say, well, you know, we trusted you, Eisenberg. You let us down, a, you let us down a, the garden path, and now we've got to raise rates. We have no choice. So Wall Street last month said they're going to raise rates Expected two rate increases out of the Fed. Two, two, two. This month, Wall Street thinks maybe we'll have seven. Because why? Because Wall Street doesn't know anything. It's not that they're stupid. They're really smart and they work hard. It's that no one knows the future. It's not knowable. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever you want, algorithms, no one can predict the future. Not possible. That said, Wall Street always thinks rates are going up. So this is the Fed funds rate, short-term interest rates, the, the rate that the Fed lends to banks. These little lines here are what Wall Street thinks is going to happen. This is insightful. Between here, 2000, dot-com bust, and 2004, rates never went up. They kept going down, 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 down. What did Wall Street think? Up, 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 up. Well, they got it right once. A broken watch gets it right once in a while, too. Here, rates do nothing but go flat, go down, and flat for like 10 years, 2005 to 2015. 10 years. Where does Wall Street think? Flat, flat, flat. Up, 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 up. They're wrong. They're just persistently wrong. So is Wall Street right now? It's possible, but there's no reason to believe they're right because they know anything. It's just they're lucky. So don't watch CNBC. Don't ask anybody what rates are going to do because no one knows. The Fed today said they don't know. The Fed said they're going to look. They're going to be thoughtful. They're going to be humble because they don't know. And they're going to be flexible and raise rates as they have to and push the joystick up if they have to, as, they, as they have to because they'll be data dependent. They don't know because nobody knows. They're smart there. I have friends who work there. They're economists like me. They're really smart. But they don't know the effing future. Now, that said, I'm going to tell you the future. <laughs> I expect the Fed to raise rates three times, from an eighth of a point to seven eighths of a point. Two are in the bag. Just a hundred. I would bet my two thumbs they get two hikes. I'd bet one thumb. I'm that sure they'll get three hikes. I bet a pinky they get four hikes. I'm really pretty sure they get four hikes. I'm not going to give my thumbs up. Give my pinky up. They'll probably do four. But they're going to try and do three and wait on the fourth one. They don't want to raise rates too fast. If you raise rates too fast, very dislocating. It hurts the economy. You want to raise it slowly and steadily. Telegraph in advance, no surprises. And hopefully, 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 I'm right. Inflation begins to come down. The Fed doesn't have to raise rates so much. But if I'm wrong and inflation stays up, and unemployment doesn't get better because we don't get a lot of workers who re-enter the labor force. If they do, if workers start to come back in the labor force, that will help unemployment not go down so much. The Fed doesn't have to raise rates so much. But if unemployment stays low and inflation stays high, they got to keep raising rates. And if they raise rates too much, what happens? Recession, right? Almost every recession we've had is because the Fed's raised rates too much in a rising industry environment. Because the Fed's behind the eight ball, they get too dedicated, they get they do too much hiking, and they wreck us because they make mistakes because they don't know the future. Now, this is the yield curve. This is making banks not happy. I'm not going to get into that right now. The other reason I'm nervous about inflation is rents. Rents have gone up like crazy. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. But there's nothing to buy out there. No homes to buy, so you'll rent an apartment. 
but there's no rental apartments in either. It's like you can't buy a new car, buy a used car. What happens to used car prices? They go up. They're causing inflation. Same thing here. This inflation could be a problem. Now, let's talk about housing. Everybody asks me the million-dollar question, is this a bubble? The answer is no. Isn't this like 2006 or 7 when prices went crazy? Yes, but the reasoning is completely different. Back in 2005, 6, it was a credit bubble that created the housing bubble. My daughter was nine. She was getting credit card offers. We didn't have a dog, but the dog probably could have got a loan. The dog could have walked in. I could have been the dog's representative. The dog makes a million bucks a year. Can I prove it? Yeah, we have a 1099 in the basement, in the, in the trunk. How much? A million dollars. Okay, you're set. We'll give you a no doc, option only liar loan. Right? You remember those, right? Countrywide. This is different. There's nothing to buy. Demand is insatiable. Work from home has changed our value of a house, and we've saved a bucket of money. And that's changed everything. Our tastes have fundamentally changed about housing. We want more space because we're afraid there'll be another pandemic, another thing. We don't know what's coming out the pike. I don't want to be the idiot who pushes 13 on the elevator, scratches their eye, gets COVID, and dies. I want a house. Mm. This is the problem. We underbuilt for a decade. Because we underbuilt for a decade, shockingly, we didn't have enough housing. Population growth was still going, but the builders weren't building. We ended up in a situation where there's no inventory. Look at the inventory. It peaks out here for one month, albeit at 4 million units. 4 million units. This is NAR data, last day of the month. Steadily goes down, down, down. It's flat. For down, down, flat, down, down. Right now, it's at the lowest it's ever been. Again, but in Denver, there are four homes for sale, right? Okay, 400 even, but it doesn't matter. There used to be 30,000, you know, 12 years ago or 13 years ago. There's nothing to buy. It didn't matter here because the recession was so bad no one wanted a house. It didn't matter here because memories of that time caused us not to want to buy a house much. But then COVID came, and the demand for housing went through the roof overnight, absolutely overnight. I had to have a house. Now, I think some people who moved out of Manhattan to Missoula will be very unhappy, and there'll be massive buyer's remorse. But not many people did that. Most moved from the city to suburbia or exurbia. That's the data, right? Because you still want to be near your friends, near your family, near work, but you could drive 20 miles away. That's what people did. They bought a bigger house because they were inexpensive in, in, an, in, in an expensive downtown. But if you moved to suburbia, it got much cheaper. And exurbia was even cheaper than that. And that's what they did. And the demand became insatiable. There's nothing to buy. And suddenly demand is huge and supply is bad. You know what happens when, when there's big demand, no supply, prices go up. So that's exactly what happened. It's all inventory. So inventory is here on, on this axis. No months, two months, four months, six months, eight months of inventory. This is the price appreciation per month. Half a percent, one percent, two percent. So one percent a month is 12 percent a year, right? And we're there. We're somewhere around there. 2% inventory, you're, you're ballparking it at between 1% and 1.5% 1 .1 a month. Call that 1.25. That's 15% a year. Data came out yesterday. What was number 17? I think it's peaked. I think it will start to go down from here. But it won't go negative. It'll remain positive. It'll be less positive than it is now. Here. Oh, I missed a slide, I think. Yeah, there. So you can see here. Prices peaked, and now they're coming down. And you can see these lines. They're not wild. There tends to be trends with them. Up, down. There are weird moments here. But generally, if you know what the prior month was, you know what the next month is. There's a lot of correlation from month to month. These things don't herky-jerk around. They up and down. So now we're going to go down. Fiscal policy becomes contractionary. Monetary policy becomes more contractionary. There's no inventory. Prices are higher. The desperados bought a house. We're not quite so desperate. We're still pretty desperate, but not as desperate as we were. I think price appreciation goes down, but it still ends up the year at 10% or something. It'll still be a really good year for price appreciation, right? And despite the fact that there's no inventory, as we've already spoken about, and prices are going up at ridiculously high levels, you would think there wouldn't be a big demand for housing, right, all by itself, but COVID has, over, has, has superseded that. This is annual sales. 
that's crazy. This is pre-COVID. All pre-COVID, post-recession, post-housing bust, pre-COVID. We never exceeded five and three quarter million. That was all we got, right? Since COVID hit, we've never, almost never, been, we've, um, we've never been less than that. That's the trough since COVID. It's higher than anything we had since the housing bust. Here, prices are going nuts, inventory is disappearing, and houses are going off the shelf like hotcakes because interest rates are super low, and COVID's changed our minds, and we have more money to spend because we've had four savings and nowhere to go and nothing to do. And worse, if you're unlucky enough to live in a house that was recently built like 10 years ago, you have a great room. Who has a great room in their house? One big room, right? That one big great room is a crappy room. Because you can't, you, your whole family's there. And you want to have a Zoom room? No. Exercise room. Junior, a place to, no. You want, you, I want to buy a new house with 24 rooms. Each 100 square feet. That way I can have privacy and I can have a, I can have a mm, namaste room or whatever it is, right? You need more rooms. You don't want a great room. A great room's a horrible thing. But the demand for homes appears to be insatiable. The fact that inventory has fallen by 50% or since the recession began or 80%, whatever, hasn't stopped buyers. It's remarkable. If someone told me that inventory could be this low and sales would barely be affected, I would have said, you're out of your mind. And I'd be totally wrong, like well, on inflation. Things just happen now. So there's no existing inventory. We got that out of the way. This is new inventory. Homes built for sale. There. Being built, permanent, not started. No homes here either. You can't get a new home. You can't get an existing home. There are no homes. Why aren't the builders building homes? Prices are going up by leaps and bounds every month. One or one and a half percent, 15, 18 percent a year. This is the market screaming for builders to build more homes, right? We've underbuilt for a decade. We're three million or four million homes short. Prices are going up really fast. Buyers are insatiable demand. Builders could make a fortune building more homes, but they don't. Why not? Regulatory costs are killing them. NIMBYism, setback requirements, mostly. Mostly setbacks in land use, killing them. Can't build a cheap house. Next, oops, can't get workers. No one can get workers, they can't get workers. So you can't get land, prior slide. You can't get labor, this slide. If you can get labor, a lot of labor's now doing rental work. Why are they doing rental work? They're doing rental work because home prices have gone like this, and interest rates have gone like that. When you have this and that, it's a recipe for, I want another floor, I want a pool, I want a $100,000 kitchen and bath reno. So workers who could build more homes are not. They're doing rental work instead. And then lumber prices have gone crazy in input prices. So what happens with lumber? This is a fascinating story. So lumber prices were banging around 400 bucks for 1,000 board feet of lumber between two and 400 bucks forever. And then they shoot up to what, 1,700? $1,700. So now they're going up again. And what happens to the builders now? They put orders in for more lumber. I don't need the lumber, but it'll be more expensive tomorrow. I better hoard it. So my just-in-time approach to, to, to inventory has become just-in-case. And just-in-case wrecks it even more, driving the price even higher, making this commodity even more volatile. So you're exacerbating volatility this is, and it costs builders more. They don't, builders have stopped building entry-level homes, right? There aren't any. Look in the car data. Any home selling for under 250,000 bucks? 300,000? So you could say, no one wants those homes. No, there are no homes in that price category left. They used to be 200, now they're four, or whatever the math works out to be, right? People would love those homes, but the builders don't build them, and the ones that were there are now either much more expensive, or they, or they tear them down and build something else. And so the builders are only building expensive homes. The median price of a new home, this is a slide that's a little outdated, is now over $400,000. 400,000 bucks. That's a lot of dough. This is home construction activity. Single famine red, multi famine blue, total in green. If we built 2 million homes a year there for three or four or five years, we'd make a real dent in the undersupply that took place last decade. But at this level of 1.6 million, we're not building enough homes to make a dent in that deficit. And this problem will, as a result, persist. 
because we're underbuilt. Last time we were overbuilt, it was a credit bubble that caused it. Now it's a fundamental demand and supply problem. And this problem's going to get worse because the builders aren't going to build enough homes. Credit conditions are going to get better. It's going to go up because as we get further from recession, people know the jobs are stable and so on and regular income and more people work and so on. But here comes the kicker. Maybe here comes no kicker. There, demographics. This is the tail end of the millennials. They're now about to enter prime home buying age. This is peak person in the US. For the next 10 years, we're going to be consumed with this group of people buying a home. They've been renting now when they were here, and then now they're right there. That's 33. That's prime home buying age in the low 30s. They're about to age in, and there are no homes to buy. So I've convinced you I think that this is a serious problem with housing, but I'm not convinced I've convinced you enough. I want to convince you more. <laughs> Apartment rental. You can't buy a new home, it's no home. Rent, right? Rent. We saw rents are going up fast. Why? Because vacancy rates are super low. I don't know about that number with COVID. That's a weird number. Something was wrong with the data. But this, even if it's true, this is the, either the lowest number in 40 years. 40 years. New home, can't get it. Existing home, nothing. Rental apartment, nothing. What do you do now? Give me ideas. Tiny homes, Tiny homes that could work. I don't have data on that, unfortunately. Uh, trailers. Trailers. Buy a trailer. Here's a trailer. Look at the price of a trailer. Trailer went from $53,000, now it's 80,000 bucks. That's the crappiest, junkiest house you can purchase. <laughs> it doesn't include the land in most cases. You don't own the land. If a trailer cost 80,000 bucks, you laughed, because you would never be caught dead in a trailer, single wide trailer. You want a double wide. There, double wide. It went from 110 to 140. You can't get a new home, you can't get an existing home, you can't rent an apartment, and you can't get a trailer. We got a problem, and we have a demographic wave about to hit us. Rental property and homes are the easiest way to make money going forward. Five, 10 years, this is a gravy train. The only fear is builders start to build. Watch inventory numbers really closely. What about things here? A couple slides, I'll wrap it up. First, retirement. Where do Americans want to retire? Unsurprisingly, Florida is number one, but look at Colorado, tied with Hawaii. Damn, that's pretty sweet. Anytime you're tied with Hawaii, that's pretty good, right? <laughs> I live in Florida, so I understand why that. Texas is cheap, I get that. New York and California, I don't understand that. People want excitement, I guess. But wait, it gets a little better. This is states ranked by overall popularity. Look where Colorado is, just behind Hawaii. And now you're better than Florida. I hate you. <laughs> but look, that's amazing. This is just random head-to-head -head matches between two states. And they ask people, which one do you prefer? This A or B? Colorado is number two out of 50. 51, because you include the District of Columbia. So Colorado is an appealing place. People move here because they like it. They like the mountains. They like the skiing. They like the outdoorsmen. They like the outdoor life. They come here by choice. People come by choice. They're happy. The mood improves. It becomes a nice place to live, like I live in Florida, because people move to Florida for the same reason. They like the weather, they're happy. If you look at the overall economy, Colorado's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with our economy. 2022 will be a good year. My fear is the Fed raises rates too much in 22 and in 23, and then by the end of 23, we might have a recession. I don't think so. I don't believe it will happen, but it could be a 20% chance, right? Could happen. Population growth over the last 10 years. Colorado's been good. There have been better states, right? Texas has done better. North Dakota's done better. Let's think. That's Idaho. That's Nevada. And that's Utah, right? So one, two, three, four, five states have been better. The only areas that's been as almost not even as good has been the U.S. South, right? All the people here in New York, Pennsylvania, you know, New Jersey, and so on, New Jersey, are moving down here. It's Texas, the Intermountain West in Colorado, and the Southeast. 
we're moving south and we're getting a little older. Average age bumps up by about a year every 10 years. We're aging and moving south. And Colorado happens to be in a great location, skiing, good weather, four seasons. Wow. Wow. So this is my key for 22. 22 is going to be a good year. Growth will be well above norm. We'll create a lot more jobs than normal. Normal is 2 million a year, 1.7 a year, actually. Yeah, more like that. Good year. The Fed's going to raise rates in Q2, which is, well, now. They'll raise rates on March 16th, to be precise, by 25 basis points or a quarter percent. We'll create lots of jobs. That's why growth is going to be better, because workers will return to the labor force. Unemployment, we'll see what happens there. Inflation, I don't think, becomes is a problem by the end of the year. I've been wrong so far. I could still be wrong. And spending on services will go up as we leave our homes. Look, I want to desperately go to a Guns N' Roses concert. <laughs> and I want to surf the mosh pit. That's what I want to do. I'm just not there yet psychologically. I will pay a lot of money for that ticket when I feel good enough to do it. It will be self-actualization. I've spoken probably too long. I have one more slide to show you, and then we'll wrap it up here. I can't get to that. Ah, oh, there we go. This is my name, my cell number, my phone number, Twitter handle, and email address. I put out 70 words every day on the economy. No graphs, no ads, no charts, no links, and no photos. The easiest way to get is to take out your phone, which you've been making love to, Text the word bow tie, one word, no hyphen, no space, to the five digit number 228282828. Two, Be prompted for an email address. You'll hear from me every day till you die, because you cannot unsubscribe from this website. Maybe I'm joking and lying. It has been, wow, it has been an immense pleasure chatting with you guys.